no, no, I, I think it's mountain lion poop. See, there's fur in it. And then Skokum Jim was like, no, this is rock badger poop. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back once again to yet another episode of the Wayward Stories podcast. Wayward Stories is the podcast dedicated to telling your stories of adventure in the great outdoors, maybe a little bit of self-discovery. It's for all of the you wayward souls out there where we basically share our experiences and tell all of our stories. Um, tonight we're going to depart from maybe our format a little bit, but we're going to stay completely on brand. But um, tonight was very re- research heavy. Tonight's episode was very research heavy for me. Um, and I will be doing a lot, doing a lot of reading, um, mostly from the NPS.gov website, National Park Service, because we're going to be talking about the Yukon Gold Rush or the Klondike Gold Rush and some stories about some individuals who went on their great adventures into the Klondike. Um, but before we get to that, how have you guys been this week? How was your weekend? My weekend was flipping awesome. Went up to the Mulberry River as I told you guys I would. And let me tell you something. It was a great weekend. It was a great weekend. First of all, got out there Friday night after work, rolling with my uh, patented modular system to get my butt outside more often. All I had to do is come home, change, and uh, basically make one stop at a grocery store for some ice, for the ice chest, and I was rolling. So I get up there and show up just in time to put up my hammock, my rain fly, for a nice, nifty little thunderstorm, including hail, lots of lightning, and heavy rain. And it was actually really awesome. I always talk about being in nature when weather is happening. There's something about being there and experiencing it. Um, it's like a full experiential situation like you can sense it from all angles you can feel it the wind the smells like everything about it it's it's um cathartic and dang near spiritual for me it's a beautiful beautiful thing and then it was beautiful after it passed a rainbow came about we had a our own little great smoky mountains going on right here in arkansas in the ozarks that night as the steam rolled up out of the mountains and the hollers as we like to say around here and actually I got some pretty cool pictures that night anyway around it first night was a cool night next day on the river 3.3 perfect absolutely perfect for some white water man I only dunked it once and that was my own fault because I kept nosing my way back into one of the rapids and trying to do a little uh, surfing and just, you know, having fun, trying to make a regular set on top, top kayak act like a playboat. And that just usually doesn't work out, but Hey, it's fun to do. And I took a, took a dunk in the drink and got a good exercise in upper body strength. Cause I literally had to climb back into that kayak because the pool below that drop had no bottom. And I was about to go into another set of rapids not in my personal watercraft. So I had to uh, work on my balance and my upper body strength and climb back into that kayak. But it was a great weekend. Had a great weekend. You guys, if you listen, need to go back and listen to last week's episode where I talk about the mulberry. I should have waited and done it this week so I could have talked about my adventure over the weekend as a part of it. But alas, we did not. It is already done. You can go back and listen to it. And tonight, we're going to talk about the Yukon Gold Rush. Specifically, we're going to talk about some badass women of the Yukon Gold Rush. I came across this by listening to another podcast a couple of weeks ago. And it was just a mention. Um, it's actually called History Unplugged. It's a great podcast. And they were talking about... It may have been the gold rush. Don't particularly recall, to be honest, but they mentioned one woman and talked about her a little bit, and that goaded me into it, prompted me along into reading and seeing about, you know what? I bet she wasn't the only badass woman up there in the Klondike, and I found a handful, and we're going to talk about them tonight. Now, is that a departure from what we do here? It's not, because they've all got some really good stories. A couple of them there's very little info about, um, so they're going to be short. 
And then we got a couple of them that are going to be a little bit longer, have a little bit more meat on the bone for us to consume. But they all are stories of adventure in the great outdoors, specifically the Klondike, which doesn't get much more romantic than to think about one of the gold rushes up in Alaska. Shit, y'all. People are still, people are still hunting for gold up there. It's on um, Discovery Channel every Friday night, last I checked. Um, But first, we need to set up the Yukon. Um, And why is it, like I said, why is it on brand? Well, for most of us, the great outdoors is a place filled with wonder. And you've, you've heard the term, probably seen the hashtag, wanderlust. And I think that those of us who love to get outside, many of us are afflicted with that little malady. And that's a part of what created the magic and the mystique behind the legend of the Yukon Gold Rush. That's a good way to put it. Because obviously gold drove the gold rush, but also other social situations like a horrid economy in the 1890s in the United States of America, a massive depression, millions of people out of work, and also this is like 30, 40 years on the heels of 1849 and the gold rush in central California, and you know, the men who went into that gold rush were in their 20s and 30s, well now they're in their 70s and 80s, right, in the 90s? Well, they've already created legends about that gold rush. And, you know, as we all know, time kind of heals all wounds. It covers over the crappy stuff. Any of you guys that are getting older, like I just turned 40 last November, I already can think back at points in my life and I'm thinking about something with just like a little bit of nostalgia and a smile on my face. And then I'm like, wait a sec. I remember what was going on then. That sucked. No, man. There was nothing good going on then. It's funny how our minds, I think it's a defense mechanism, some kind of psychological defense mechanism. And, you know, our minds tend to wipe out, smooth over, and black out the worst stuff and help us to remember the good stuff. So you got a bunch of 40 40 years, you know, 40 years on, 60, 70, 80-year-old miners sitting around in downtown San Francisco in the 1890s who have been telling their stories their magical love stories of the great gold rush of 1849 for, you know, 30, 40 years. And suddenly, word comes in, gold has been found. And you've got a bunch of poor, out-of-work people with the mystique of the gold rushes of winter's past in their mind. And as one historian put it, named Pierre Breton, psychologically, the Klondike was just far enough away to be romantic and just close enough to be accessible. It's a steamship ride, guys. For the most part. And then the last stretch is where it gets crazy. And that's what we're going to set up real quick. So that we can give you context. When you're thinking about these badass women. And what they did to get into the Klondike. And do what they did. You have some idea of how hard it was to do that. Um, the gold rush in itself. It started... Um, actually, the gold was found on August 16th in 1896 by an American prospector named George Carmack, his taggish wife, Kate Carmack, and her brother, Skookum Jin, and nephew, Dawson Charlie. They're all on the Klondike River, and they found gold. It is not clear who discovered that gold, but George Carmack is the man who made the claims because he was full-blood um, white European <laughs> American westward conqueror and they were afraid that if any of the others placed the claim that it wouldn't be recognized because they were all din- indigenous peoples they were first nations people um specifically of the tagish people of the alaskan in that general area and you'll have to forgive me anyone out there if i get the pronunciations wrong i looked up i listened to youtube videos i tried to get as many right as i could and if they are wrong please forgive me um, in any event, the gold was present along this river in huge quantities, and they measured out four claims for themselves, set it up, and they got to mining. But because they're in the Yukon and the river was already frozen over for the year, and they were basically isolated by Mother Nature, she socked them in. Word didn't get out until basically the summer in the Yukon of the next year, in July 1897, and then it was on. 100,000 people tried to get to the Klondike gold fields, of whom only 30 to 40,000 eventually, keyword emphasize, eventually did. 
And that was the height of the Klondike Gold Rush. And it was in the summer of 1897 until the summer of 1898. In order to get to the Klondike Gold Fields, they had to take one of two routes. They took a steamship to either Dye or Skagway, both in southeast Alaska. And this is where basically they set up, got all their business together, and got prepared, became prepared to go over the mountain into the Klondike. And they only had two trails they could take. They could either take the Chilkoot Trail or the White Pass Trail. And they both ended up terminated at the Yukon River where Dawson City sprang up. You've probably heard of Dawson City somewhere down the line. It's kind of pop culture famous um, for this very event. And from there, they got to take the river, basically. But it was treacherous on the river in the Klondike. Um, But we're going to set this up. We're going to talk about what the conditions were like getting over these two passes. Number one, we need to talk about that in Alaska, in the Klondike goldfields, in this area, winter is from October to June. Do that math. They have a very long winter, and temperatures can get to negative 58 degrees. Once you get above the tree line, there are no more wind breaks. I talk about this when in my um, Exploring Central Colorado episode, when I was up there and got above the, the tree line, there are no more wind breaks, and the wind howls at those altitudes. Y'all, it gets cold. Think about this, minus 58 degrees plus, I promise you, I couldn't find any confirmation of it, but I promise you, they struggled mightily with wind and blizzard conditions, and it was going to be, it's a brutal thing. So these two trails from Dye and Skagway, they're two different little towns that had sprung up, sprang up, proper terminology there, in southern Alaska, to take these routes. So the White Pass Trail specifically, they were the ones that landed in Skagway, and they had to take the White Pass Trail before they could cut across to Bennett Lake. The trail began gently and it progresses over several mountains with paths as narrow as two feet wide, covered with boulders and sharp rocks. And under these conditions, horses died in huge numbers, giving the route the informal name of Dead Horse Trail. Y'all, it was brutal. I have a picture here in front of me of dead horses on the Dead Horse Trail, and it's a war zone. It looks like a war zone. I mean, I can't I can't quite put into words for you how crazy it is, but in my mind, in the back of my mind now, and for the rest of this episode, all that is going to be in my mind, because as soon as I look at this picture, all I can hear is, let the bodies hit the front. Let the bodies hit the front. Yeah, it's going to be with me for the rest of the episode, and I will try to keep from bursting into that. Because I don't think any of us want to hear that. I don't want to do it. You don't want to hear it. I like you guys. I want you to stick around. We don't need to go there. Um, White Pass Trail was 22.4 miles long. And an elevation gain of 4,350 feet. Not quite a mile high. But think about that. You're on foot. Because your horse died. Because you tried to take him up over this pass where he got stuck. And got exhausted. And they had to take several trips to do this. Here's the thing. Canadian authorities, once this got going, because you have to cross over into Canada at a point on these trails. Once things got going, people were up there starving to death. Horses are dying by the thousands. And they're like, all right, you got you got to bring in like at least 1,100 pounds of food. Enough for an entire year. And then all your gear to mine. And it is amounted to essentially a literal ton of crap that you yourself had to figure out how to get oh my god i don't remember the complete number but we're talking you know you're 20 to 35 miles depending on the trail you take just to dawson city and i think you got like 500 miles in to the gold fields up the river at that point um don't quote me on that let's see i mean the grand trip in total coming from Seattle up was 4,700 miles long. So this was a thing. So you have brutal conditions. You're trying to hike yourself after your damn horse died because you worked it to death. 22.4 miles up 4,350 feet in negative 58 degree temperatures, driving wind, driving snow. I mean, oxygen up there, it's an issue. Um, This was a brutal, brutal situation. And going up the river, guys, What's no easier? Have you ever, like, they had to do that during the summer, and many people got in real situations because they were trying to go in too late, 
and the river was freezing over for the winter as they were trying to get in. And they ended up stuck in camps along the river for the whole long, for the entirety of the long arse winter. Doing what? Nothing. Sitting in their tents, eating their 1,100 pounds of food that they brought. It was a brutal, brutal thing to try to get into the gold fields up there. The other way in was the Chilkoot Trail, which is 32 miles and you gain 6,043 feet. This one, this one was a little more brutal. This was from Dai. If you landed in Dai, you had to go um, up through the Chilkoot Trail. And it, <laughs> and then you had to reach Lake Lindemann, which fed into Lake Bennett at the head of the Yukon River. The Chilkoot Pass was higher than the White Pass, but mo- more people used it, around 22,000 during the gold rush. The trail passed up through camps until it reached a flat ledge. And just before the main ascent, which was too steep for animals, mind you, this location was known as the scales, and it's where goods were weighed before people officially entered Canada. The cold and the steepness of the weight made the equipment a steep steepness of the weight of the equipment made the climb extremely arduous and it could take up to a day to get to the top, which was only a thousand foot higher than you were. Just like on the White Pass Trail, supplies needed to be broken down into smaller packages and carried in a relay. Think about that. How many trips? Did you have to make up that damn mountain with 60, 80, 100 pounds on your back? Because you had, remember, almost a ton. That's 2,000 pounds. That's a bunch of trips in the brutal cold, in the brutal conditions, on a soaking wet trail. I'm sure your feet were wet. Boots, rubber boots, waterproof boots, hard to come by back in the day. Um, Did exist but hard to come by. And yeah, it was a brutal, brutal trip across for everyone. Everyone that went had to take these routes. There were other routes that began to spring up, but these were the two major thoroughfares, the two most used, and really the two that all the women that we're going to talk about tonight had to travel in on. So they're all that matter to us. Um, at the head of the Yukon River, they would get down and it became, it became Dawson City. Yeah, the final 500 miles down to the Yukon, to Dawson City in the spring. So there you go. From Lake Bennett, that was my mistake. Correction. At Lake Bennett and Lindemann, they camped to build rafts or boats that they had to build that would take them the final 500 miles down the Yukon to Dawson City. Dawson City sprang up because it was right there in the heart of it all. Um, Many, many boats were wrecked and several hundred people died trying to get the final 500 miles to Dawson City by boat. So much so that the Northwest Mounted Police introduced safety rules and they vetted each boat carefully and forbid women and children to travel through the rapids. That will come into play later in the story. But that's what it would take to get your butt to the Yukon during the gold rush, during the Klondike gold rush, or also known as the Yukon Gold Rush. So now that we've set the stage for how brutal of a trip it was to get there, keep that in mind for everyone that went. They're all on foot because their horses died on <laughs> White Horse or White White Pass Trail. And that should set the stage in the context for the stories we're going to talk about here of these women who made this trip and what they did while they were there. And it is impressive. We are going to start out with Shaw Tlea, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, I think I am, was indigenous to the area. She was of the Tagish people. They were native to that area. They were First Nations people. And she was also known by another name, what they would call an Anglicanized name. Let's say it for what it is, a white person name, as Kate Carmack, because she had married George Carmack. Do you remember that name from just 10 minutes ago? She is our first badass woman of the Yukon Gold Rush because guess what? She was in the party that discovered the gold that started it all. Um, She spent her childhood in the South Central Utah Yukon. She was native Tagish, one of eight children, and she was went into an arranged marriage <laughs> between the coastal Tlingit people and the Tagish people to formalize trading partnerships. But after her husband died... Her mother encouraged her to marry her deceased sister's husband, a white man named George Carmack. And seven years after their marriage, they gave birth to a daughter, Graffy. So this woman got a child in the Yukon. And they're up there prospecting, hunting, fishing, and surviving. In all those conditions I done talked about. 
she was badass. Um, she was traveling with them in on August 17th, 1896, when they discovered this gold. And George was the only white member of the group because the two other people were her brother and her nephew. And they both have hmm, properly anglicanized names given to them as well, but they're kind of funny. Skookum Jim and um, Dawson Charlie. Anyway, they let George make the claim. That's going to be important in a little while because he was white and they were afraid that, again, their claim wouldn't be recognized since they were indigenous. Now, here's what they say. They, they talk about that either George, they don't know if George or Skookum Jim made the discovery. They just know who staked it. Y'all, I can put that debate to rest right now. I know who made the discovery, and it wasn't either one of them. It was Shaw. I mean, let's talk about what we know about the world, men and women. I promise you what was happening is George and Skookum Jim and Doss and Charlie were probably arguing over some animal poop they found in the creek, trying to decide what it was. And Kate was over there. Shaw was over there looking at piles of gold. She had probably already mapped out their entire future and was ready. She's like, guys, guys, come here, check this out, guys. And Jim's like, no, no, I, I think it's mountain lion poop. See, there's fur in it. And then Skookum Jim was like, no, like, I'm native, and I know what's going on here because I live here. This is rock badger poop. And, of course, uh, George, you think, no, 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 because George's going to be a know-it-all, right? All the while, Kate's over here, guys, guys eventually eventually they listened to her and they all got rich really fast um now they did very well in the very beginning they were the first to be there they were first to start mining things and they had like six eight months where it was all to themselves pretty much because word wasn't going to get out to portland and seattle and san, uh, san francisco until the spring thaw and people could actually leave the area um, the first year after the discovery, it didn't change much for them. They worked their claim for two seasons. They lived in this cabin. She kept the house, cared for her daughter, did the laundry, mined for gold, sewed moccasins, warm winter clothes, sold them to other miners. When the other miners started showing up, she provided them mills and clothes and started picking berries and trapping rabbits and other critters of the Northwest. And yeah, she basically kicked everyone's ass she was the first one there likely the one that discovered it in my opinion and did i mean think about it guys have you ever have you ever gone on lengthy backpacking trips somewhere far less adventurous than alaska far less extreme weather wise it's not easy is it living out there's not easy well this woman was up there keeping three idiot men in line caring for a child making clothes, making food, and basically cashing in on the miners that were coming. This is something that's known as mining the miners. There were people that went there to try to get rich on the gold, and then there were smart people, i.e. women, who, <laughs> the majority of which are all the people we're talking about tonight, who didn't necessarily mine for gold. They mined the miners. They made their money off the people that were there looking for the gold. And then when they got a whole bunch of those people's money, they went and they bought up mining claims. It's really kind of beautiful, if you think about it. It's really kind of beautiful. So Shaw Tlea, the taggish woman, also known as Kate Carmack, she was the very first woman, historically speaking, of the Yukon Gold Rush, because she found it, and our very first badass woman of our stories for tonight. There's not a whole lot about her, so there's... Again, that's what we've got right there. There's not a lot of good historical record from that time about a lot of these people. Um, but let's do sew this up. Let's do finish her story a little bit. It's got a little bit of a sad ending, but we need to point it out. It's important that we know about this woman who was such a badass and the discoverer of the gold. In the fall of 1898, after they done got rich, of all this money, they had all the gold. She was mining the miners. They were mining their claims. They got rich, and they decided to go to Seattle. And basically, it says here, celebrate their riches, but, like, they stayed there. So I'm thinking they were like, they cashed out. Let's take our stuff, get out of this environment. Let's go to the big city. They went to Seattle, planned to buy a yacht to sell to Paris with their millions. And apparently adapting to life in the big city was not easy for Shaw. 
and within a year, George and, Schla and Shaw's marriage fell apart, and after 13 years of marriage, he left her for another woman and then claimed they had never been officially married. She attempted to file for divorce, but there was no official record of their marriage because it happened in the Yukon in the absence of, like, the kind of authority needed to make something official. And so he, you know, remarried this other woman, and guess what? If they were never officially married, guess what's officially not hers? The gold mining claims. Or any of the money. And so she went back to the Yukon Territory with absolutely nothing. Her brother built her a cabin in Carcross, where most of their family had settled. And she earned a small income from selling needlework to tourists for the rest of her life. Um, her daughter, Graffy, got lured away to Seattle and stayed there with her dad. And that pretty much finished off Schlaw, because she firmly believed in the taggish belief that children belong with the mother's clan. Well, Graffy remarried, or Ga Graffy married, and never saw her mother again, and Shaw remained with her taggish clan and lived out the rest of her life in Carcross, Yukon Territory, and never received her share of any mining riches and was supported by a government pension until her death. We point that out because she was a badass. She kept the home going and the mining claim. She did both. She probably found it, and in the end, because she was A, a minority woman, and B, a woman in the 1890s, she died with nothing. That sucks. But we also tell stories about history for a reason, because we don't remember history, we repeat history. Let's move on to our next badass woman of the Yukon. Again, I remind you, all that setup we did in the context of how damn hard it was to get there and how brutal the conditions were. So we're not going to tell that story over and over again for all these people. You just know they did it. And that alone makes them a badass for getting there. And that goes for both male and female. Um, but you have to understand, too, the social conditions, the social climate of the 1890s for women. And it makes it all the more impressive. How they bucked those stereotypes basically gave the thumb to the man and went out and did something awesome. Bessie Couture is awesome because not only is she a woman, she is a black woman. She was the first African-American woman to own a business in the Klondike. So she mined the miners, as we were talking about earlier. She made her way in that epic journey through, I don't remember which way she went in. Let's see. Actually, her restaurant that she owned was in Skagway. So it was where in one of the towns where the people landed. She was the first known black business owner in Alaska. And despite this achievement, we don't know much about her. This is also of note. The Skagway census of 1930 and 1940, Bessie is listed as the head of household and as owning her own home, which was an achievement for a woman at this time and not only a woman, an African-American woman. So this was a bad woman, man. She was up there in the conditions, a successful entrepreneur in the face of the social conditions against her for her race, her ethnicity, and for her gender. And she owned a successful business, mind the miners. She didn't have to go out there in the gold field. She did it the smart way. She set her up a nice little restaurant where it's nice and warm. She cooked people food and God knows what else she probably offered there. I mean, they would offer supplies most likely in a lot of these little situations. The guys coming in and women coming in that were going over the past, they needed stuff. And so they mined the miners and she bucked all the trends and the societal norms of the time was a successful business owner, which was hard enough for anyone. But for her as an African-American woman, she had even more obstacles and she did that. And that makes her a badass, in my opinion. And she is the second person that we're going to talk about tonight. And again, there's even less about her. Like we just covered it. Even less about her to talk about. There just isn't a lot of good records from that time. And um, unfortunately, that is just about all anyone knows of her. The Matter of Park National Park Service's website has a listing where it's like if you have any information more about her, if you happen to be an old, you know, a family member, a um, a descendant, and have more information or any kind of uh, paperwork or anything like that, they want it because they want to know more about her, and just nobody has anything. Let's move on to our third woman, badass woman of the Yukon, guys. The can you imagine 
the mystique, the allure of the Yukon. Think about it. And I mean, people take cruises up there and all kinds of things into Alaska because it's beautiful. God, they're, what is it? Is it History Channel or Discovery Channel? Where they have all these shows about um, like life below zero and all those different things. They're really interesting. If you watch those videos, it's gorgeous there. It's brutal there, but it's gorgeous there. But like we, the human spirit, it's about freedom, guys. Like we long for freedom. And there's nothing more free than like lawless and desolate lands like that. So far from civilization, from societal constraints, like you go there and your life depends on you and no one else. And I think that's the beauty and the allure of places as remote and desolate. And well, desolate's not necessarily a good word for Alaska, depending on where you're at, but remote, inaccessible. You rely on yourself and nobody else. For a lot of people, that is quite alluring. Um, so there is a magic to it. There is a certain magic and a certain pull to it. And, you know, again, that's why we're talking about it tonight. That's what we talk about here at Wayward Stories is Wayward Souls. People out there looking, searching for that greater land, searching for themselves, searching for that awesome adventure. And this just fits the bill tonight, man. I Man, Alaska has definitely made my bucket list. When we get to the end of this episode, we're going to talk about what you can do up there now in the Yukon. And it's I'm going to tell you right now, a preview has made my bucket list for like, when the podcast blows up someday and I make all them Benjamins, I'm going to go to Alaska till then. I just got to dream about it, but let's move on to our next badass woman of the Yukon, which is Harriet Pullen. She is a great example of a woman who honed her business skills to succeed during the Klondike gold rush. And she seized opportunities that came along with all the chaos. She arrived in Skagway with the early fortune seekers in the fall of 1897 and started out like many others broke, but optimistic and ambitious of her arrival. She later said, I only had $7 to my name. I didn't know a soul in Alaska and I had no place to go. So I stood on the beach in the rain while a tinted Skagway of 1897 shouted, cursed, and surged about me. She initially gained employment working for Captain William Moore, a man of means and wealth, and supplemented her income by selling apple pies. Her successful pie business quickly led to bigger enterprises. She sent for her horses from Washington State and geared them up to haul freight for miners over the rugged White Trail, White Pass Trail, also known as Dead Horse Trail. Think about that. She had a resource. She had horses that could carry way more than a man. And she saw, she saw the opportunity. I can charge these dumb dudes out the nose. And they did. Like the numbers, I don't have them in front of me, but if you're interested in it, you can Google it. There's all kinds of resources for this. And I don't want to misquote it, but there are places where people were charging 28 29 30 40 50 dollars a, a pound to carry stuff over the pass for the miners do that math when your load that's got to get across that pass is nearly 2,000 pounds 50 dollars a pound that's insane she sent for her horses and she got rich so she gets this freight this freight business going and she made enough to support herself and her children and from that Those profits, she made a smooth yet big transition, and when the White Pass and Yukon Route Railroad was completed, it closed down the freight lines, so she joined the thriving business of tourism. She purchased the grand home of Captain Moore, which she then converted into one of Alaska's most luxurious hotels. She gained, or Harriet gained, yeah, a hospitable reputation in her accommodations, which boasted hot baths and soft beds. Guests staying at the Pullen House Mansion enjoyed fresh b- vegetables picked from her garden along with milk and cream from her farm in Dai. She also provided dramatic presentations in the parlor of the P- Pullen House, drawing on her personal stories and experiences from Skagway's colorful cast of Gold Rush characters and events. She affectionately became known as Ma Pullen and shared her hospitality with visitors, hospitality in her vibrant hotel until she died in 1947. That is a hella success story. And I mean, dude, think about it. Y'all think about it. She started out making pies. That's the American dream. I can make a pie and I can buy stuff for pies. 
I mean, that's, that's a freaking lemonade stand, man. Like it's something that used to be possible in America. It was the American dream. She started out making pies and made enough money and then saw an opportunity. She got her horses, started charging people out the nose who had gold fever, or as they say, did say at the time, Klondike-itis, and took all that money and then bought a hotel. Like, man, y'all, y'all, that is badass. Like, oh, God, I would have married that woman, like, in a heartbeat. I've been like, please, and she wouldn't have let me. She'd have been like, no. I don't need you. <laughs> she like, I don't need you. Oh God. But that's, oh, I love that. I love that story so much. Um, but we got to keep moving. We're already running. We're running in on, on, on this episode. We got to keep moving. Let's move on to number four, badass woman of the Yukon. And that is Belinda Mulrooney. This is actually the woman that inspired tonight's research and inspired tonight's story. This is the woman I learned about on History Unplugged. You guys should go check them out. If you like history, I'm a history nerd. You probably don't. A lot of people don't care for it. But History Unplugged, you can find it, I think, on any of your podcast players. And um, I just almost his name was on the tip of my tongue, but I'll get it wrong. I know it's Scott, but I don't remember his last name. Great, great show. And I learned about Belinda Mulrooney. So this, this here... This is the woman who inspired tonight's episode. She was, again, an entrepreneur and purportedly the richest woman in the Klondike. They called her the Queen of the Klondike. She made one fortune in the Klondike gold rush, lost it, and then amassed a second, which lasted her the rest of her damn life. That is badass. She was born in County Sligo, Ireland. She was young, immigrated to Pennsylvania, her father worked as a miner, sent her to live with relatives, set out on her own, and operated a sandwich stand during the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Colorado. And with her profits, she from that, from selling hot dogs, she, she set out for San Francisco in 1894 and then set up an ice cream parlor. She lost everything in a fire, but she found employment as a stewardess on the Pacific Coast Steamship Company ship SS City of Topeka, plying its route from California to Alaska. Could you imagine, guys, I just want to take a a cruise ship to California or uh, to Alaska. They all set out from California, I think. Can you imagine? I've seen pictures. I know people that have done it. I've seen pictures. It's beautiful. I just want to do that. She got a job. Like, that was her job, riding a boat up to Alaska and back. Um, (laughs) And she earned extra money by selling necessities and luxuries to the passengers. The discovery of gold at Juneau, Alaska motivated her her to move north in 1896, and then came the Klondike gold rush in Canada to the east. Instead of seeking her fortune as a prospector, she bought supplies of silk. This, This is where it gets awesome. She bought supplies of silk underwear, bolts of cotton cloth, and hot water bottles. With her savings of $5,000, that conversion rate, it's a ridiculous amount of money that she had saved. I mean, God, her $5,000 in 1896 is way more than money I have in the bank right now. That $5,000 is worth like, what, 100 times that? I don't know. The conversion rate. Didn't look it up, and we're going to keep rocking. But she transported all of this stuff over the Chilkoot Pass to Dawson City. We talked about Chilkoot. It wasn't easy. She got... $5,000 $5,000 worth of silk underwear, bolts of cotton cloth, and hot water bottles. And she rolled over into Dawson City, where all the miners were, and she turned all of that stuff over for six times the profit. She turned five grand into 30 grand, and that's in 1890s money. It was enough money <laughs> to build a restaurant next to a roadhouse called The Magnet. And then the Grand Forks Hotel and restaurant near the gold field. She turned all those things over. She bought hot water bottles and underwear, y'all. Sold them for six times the markup. And then bought a hotel, set herself up, and did so well, she started buying mining claims. And by the end of the year, she was either owned or was partner in five mining claims. She sold the hotel for 24 Gs and set about building the finest hotel in Dawson, the Fairview Hotel. And it opened its doors on 27 July, 1898, with a restaurant and room for 30 guests. 
I don't need to mention again that she's a badass, do I? I think that she's, I think that her, I think her record speaks for itself. She once part, this is a great story. She once partnered with fellow Klondike legend Alex McDonald to salvage the cargo from a small ship that had wrecked on a sandbar. McDonald got there first and thought, I'm going to rook this lady. And he took all the food and anything of value and left only the gum boots and whiskey behind. But she got her revenge because the next spring, when the very same man, McDonald, needed gum boots for his workers, he had to pay her $100 a pair. Think about that. 1890s money. She got him. She got her money back. And then some. Um, on October 1st, 1900, she married a self-styled count, Charlie Eugene, Charles Eugene Carbonneau, was a French aristocrat, claimed to be, probably about as French as I am, but was actually a champagne salesman and former barber from Quebec. By 1903 or 1904, they separated, and she lost her fortune, and she obtained a divorce in 1906. Starting over, she moved to Fairbanks, Alaska in 04 and 05 and prospered once again, where she established the Dome City Bank in Fairbanks. She started a bank, y'all. Let that sink in. She started a bank. She eventually retired to Yakima, Washington, where she had a large mansion built in 1910, and she supported her family until her money ran out. She then moved to Seattle, where she died in 1967. She was the penultimate badass of the Yukon Gold Rush. But we have one more, and I saved her for last. Because her story is more detailed, more epic, and well, it's probably not a whole lot more epic than any of these other ladies was were, but it's it's recorded much better because she was a journalist of the time, which was rare for there to be a woman journalist in the 1890s. That was rare. That alone makes her pretty badass. But she was not one to sit around. Her name was Emma Kelly. And she was all about the adventure, which is what we are all about here at Wayward Stories. And this is why she got saved for last, because her story was and is an adventure indeed. She left Topeka, Kansas for the Klondike on September 10th, 1897. Before she left, she did employment savvy things like contact newspapers from Chicago, Kansas City and St. Louis to report for them and to them on the Klondike gold rush. So she set out from Seattle and first landed in Juneau, Alaska, where she traveled up the Lynn Canal to Dye. The people she encountered had told her that she was too late to start over the trail to Dawson. It was getting too late in the year, and many men did not think she could handle the journey. She was an, unable to get experienced packers, so she got 10 deckhands from the steamships to pack for her, promising them food and 50 cents a pound per day. For all, or 50 cents per pound for all that they carried over to Lake Lindemann. The weather on the hike to Sheep Camp proved to be quite challenging. Emma and the Packers faced blizzard-like conditions on their hike. Some of her men wanted to turn around, but get this. She told them that, listen, gentlemen, you can make this damn trip if I can. And she held them to their contracts <laughs> and made them hike over that pass. I got a feeling... You guys ever seen that that look, right? When you mess up. I suspect she didn't even have to threaten them. I suspect there didn't even have to be a specific threat. She said it. And they listened. Because they knew that their fate would be determined <laughs> by how they chose to respond. Anyway, they indeed followed her over the pass. Determined, she overcame the doubts of her being able to make it. And once they made it to Lake Lindemann, she walked around and observed various stages of Stampeder's, boats, Stampeder's boat building pro progress. At one tent, she met a man who was in a party of 22 men and three boats planning on heading out the next day for Dawson City. Remember, we're talking 500 miles up this river. Upon talking with the whole company, she proposed to them her business and asked to travel along. The men were uncertain. Of course, because they're arrogant. <laughs> and they were uncertain that they could fit Emma and that she could manage the trip. 
along with her thousand pound of goods and her Newfoundland dog, Klondike, which she had brought from the States. However, they were nearly out of money to pay Canadian custom duties, so they agreed to bring her along for a passage of $125, which is about $3,560 in 2016. We're five years beyond that. Inflation's been bad. Probably about five grand. Um, on the river, afraid that the men in her outfit might find her a nuisance, she never complained or asked any assistance from any of them. She just manned the up and did it as well as any of them did. And the next day, they set out from Lake Lindemann, and they made it to Lake Bennett on October 6th, where they camped for two days. When the outfit made it onto the Yukon River, their first test was at Miles Canyon, where the current became swift just before reaching Whitehorse. This stretch of river would later be known for wrecking boats and taking lives of unskilled pilots by the drove. Emma announced that she would ride the rapids in the boat even after being told that no man ever consented to taking a woman through the rough waters. <laughs> Huh. She would later write of the experience. I wanted to see and experience this so-called danger, which men freely court, but women may only read or hear of. I'm also kind of in love with her. Um, after making a successful run on the rapids the first time, she got out. She got out of the boat and hiked back to ride on the second boat. She was like, yo, and just hung him the rod. She dropped the mic, walked back up the river, got in another boat, and said, look at me now. God, this is such a great story. So she goes back through on the second boat. While walking back, she had slipped on some ice along the trail, fell 15 feet down a cliff, hitting her head and knocking her unconscious. Her dog, Klondike, was a good doggo, alerted the men in her outfit by barking and jumping around, and when the men reached her and revived her, she was still determined to ride through the canyon again, and she did. Once the group was past Miles Canyon, they came to Whitehorse Rapids, which looked much more dangerous than what they had just passed through, and Emma recounted this in an article written for Lippincott's Monthly Magazine. The rapids looked much more dangerous than those at the canyon, as for the ride through, I do not know whether, when I have ever enjoyed anything so much in my life. I snugly stowed myself away in the prow of the boat, and the men got ready. The word was given, and the lion cast loose, and we were off. The wild waves rocked and rolled our boat, and occasionally broke over us. The spray rose so thick and high we could not see the shore, the very air seeming a sea of misty spray. It was simply glorious. All too soon we rode into comparatively smooth yet rapid water, a few more strokes of the oars sent us to the shore, and the ride was over, leaving a sensation never to be forgotten. I want to experience that myself. That is so epic. She took a second ride through the White Horse Rapids as well. She walked back up and got on another boat. This time, she took up an oar and said, I'll show you. And she received hearty congratulations, patronizing and condescending, I am certain. That's an editor's note, not written by the National Park Service, I assure you. And the men around her claimed that she was the first woman to take up an oar riding through the White Horse. This woman's a badass. The rest of the trip down the Yukon River for Emma and the outfit saw dropping temperatures and drift ice getting thicker and fur the further north they traveled. There was a concern that the ice may grow too thick and the boats would freeze over and be blocked in for the winter. Everyone was determined to make a good time. But with the days getting shorter, they ate most of the meals in the boat and slept only at night in the snow or in the snow banks on the river, occasionally using cuttings of spruce boughs for bedding. Think, think about that, guys. Hey, let's just strip this tree of its boughs. Like, no, any of us that are like have been out there or done any kind of survival work, like we've slept on, you know, pine, spruce, whatever's available. We've made beds to keep us insulated from the ground, right? That's where you lose all your body heat is to the ground. But think about it in Alaska when winter's setting in and you're sleeping out on spruce boughs on the ground and she's up there bucking trends, bucking socio norms and like basically showing these dudes what's up. Like, oh my God, that's so cool. And like impressive because like not even like taking it out of like this whole gender thing like oh she's a woman she did everything to mend it I mean that's obviously the point of tonight's episode is badass women 
And that's awesome. We need to celebrate that. But like for anyone, how miserable would that be? Like she was a journalist from Topeka, Kansas. Like for a lot of us that get out and go and do and stay in adverse conditions, we would still be miserable, even though we're more acclimated, more used to it. We would be freaking miserable in, in that kind of a situation. That is the freaking magic and the beauty and the allure of this Yukon adventure. That's why it's such a great, great subject for tonight's episode. Anyway, anyway, editorializing aside, let's finish the last part of her story. She arrived in Dawson City on November 1st, 1897. The river was nearly impassable and, in fact, the very next day completely froze over for the winter. When the boats were docked on the evening of November 1st, they set up their tents and the men wanted to celebrate. She put up the money to purchase a few bottles of whiskey, and while the men were drinking and celebrating, Emma got out her guitar and led everyone in singing songs of home. While living and working in Dawson City, Emma Kelly would ride out that first winter by sled to various mining camps and check on the situations at hand. She reported that over the winter in Dawson City, daily wages were dropping. There were such large numbers of people in Dawson City that it drove the price, drove down the price for work. And winter wages decreased from $15 a day to $6, $8, and $10 a day. In Dawson, she became a member of the Arctic Press Club consisting of 14 men and just herself, the sole female. Despite the reports of dropping wages, citizens in Dawson still came out to have some fun over the winter. The Arctic Press Club held balls in town that got, had large turnouts. Emma ended up owning, because she's a badass, two mines in the Klondike. One at Dawson City, one at Circle City, and she, which she had acquired in her first few months there. In a letter published in the Kansas City Star on April 27, 1898, Emma mentions her claim. The miners and all around here... Yeah, the minders in all around here call me the Skookum Queen. I am the only girl holding property on the Gulch. The following is my address. Emma Leonidas Kelly, number five, above Bonanza Creek, Klondike District, Dawson City, Northwest Territory. She was, in that area, the only woman holding a mining claim. After, she was the only woman to take up an oar and ride the White Horse um, Rapids, or the White Pass Rapids. She was verifiably, quantifiably measurable by every metric that you can pull out of the box, was a badass. A badass woman of the Yukon Gold Rush. Um, To me, like that's just so freaking epic. All of them, all of them, for different reasons in different ways, did amazing things. Because regardless of the fact that they're women, that doesn't make really any difference. I mean, except for the social norms of the time, the things that were against them to keep them from completing those kinds. I mean, we have our first African-American business owner and it just happened to be a woman and she was super successful. We have, oh my God, so many like Belinda Mulrooney who made, lost, made, lost, and then made again a fortune doing it over and over again because she was that damn good. And then here we got Emma who basically told the dudes to sack up. Like they were like, nah, fam, we don't want to go. No, no, no. We don't want to go. And she was like, you sissy weasels. I'm going to do it. So you're going to do it. And they were like, okay, yeah, we're going to do it. Are you like, do you want to argue with her? And dude was like, no. And they did it. Like, I love it. I love all these stories. They were great. I love all these stories. Um, We need to talk about, real quickly, to wrap up this episode, what we can do today in the Yukon. What we could pop, you know, how we, as the modern, intrepid explorers of the 2020s, what's there for us to do? There's a lot for us to do there. And this is why it has found its way onto my bucket list. There is some amazing stuff to do up there. Number one, the Chilkoot Trail is now a National Park Service administrated trail. And it's in conjunction with the Canadians. Hey, guys, if you're from Canada, please forgive me. It's not right in front of me. 
but whatever the proper name for the Canadian version of the National Park Service they have, it might just be the Canadian National Park Service, but don't have it in front of me. They have a joint collaboration because this trail crosses into Canada and they've got some agreements worked out and things where people can go in and hike this trail. Um, you can do four or five day hikes. There are like ultra marathoners that run it, run it, run it in a day, which I'm not about that. Good for you guys. Good on you, but not me. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the Chilkoot Trail real quick, because this is one of the biggies you can do there. You can go back and you can retrace the steps of everyone who crossed that pass and went down the Chilkoot Trail. Again, it's uh, 32.5 miles. Where do I have my paperwork on that? It was right in front of me. Anyway, you're going to gain a whole lot of elevation. You're going to hike 32.5 miles. You've got several camps you can make it to. You've got the trailhead from the trailhead to Beaver Pond is 2.7 miles to Finnegan's Point, which is a camp, five miles to Canyon City, 7.7 miles. Canyon City ruins are there. They say this is, they call this the world's longest museum because there are all kinds of historical artifacts left over from the gold rush of 1897, still extant and there to be viewed and appreciated um on to 10.7 miles is pleasant camp on to sheep camp then you make a ginormous 3,000 foot descent over the next two and a half to three miles it looks like she can sheep camp to chilkoot pass is 13 miles to 16 so three and a half miles you're going to gain 3,000 feet and then down the other side you have happy camp deep lake linderman city bear Loon lake and bennett all of those are camps 32.5 miles 33 miles, it looks like. Hella elevation gain. Brutal conditions. You can make a three to five day hike out of it, which is what most do. Um, it's going to be like an awesome backpack adventure. You got to worry about grizzly bears and all that good stuff. It it looks absolutely epic, guys. Like, I absolutely love it. As far as the other trail, the White Pass Trail, it's not actually a hiking trail. I bet you could hike it, but you're like walking on a road. It is a highway now. And it is the White Pass Scenic Drive, scenic drive 22.4 miles, lightly trafficked point-to-point trail. Um, apparently, it looks absolutely beautiful. The pictures on here are amazing, but it is a driving tour. I'm sure you could hike it. You could probably walk that road, um, but it looks really cool. But here's another one. This, to me, is epic. You can go to White Pass. You can go on a <laughs> Bennett Camping Adventure, which is where you pay 20 American dollars to ride a train over the original narrow gauge railroad that was originally built during that gold rush to help alleviate the traffic from those two foot, you know, foot traffic from those trails. They built the train line across there. You can now ride across that very pass on that very same three foot wide narrow gauge railway through tunnels and trestles and all the amazing beauty of the Yukon and the Klondike for $20. And that includes a hearty turkey sandwich sides and a dessert. Y'all, y'all, you can bring your kayak and your canoe for another $30. They'll slap it on. I guess they strap it to the top of the train. That's what I would do. Um, and you can go into Bennett camp where you can camp in one of the original the ruins of one of the original towns and stay there and take your kayak, your canoe, whatever you're there to do, you can go out and do it. Like, Oh my God. Can you imagine a scenic excursion train guys up through? I'm going, I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to make some money. Like, I mean, you have to rob a bank. I don't know. Like, I don't suggest that kids, but at some point when I can make the logistics work, think about this. Can you imagine taking a cruise ship to Alaska from Alaska, disembarking and stepping foot onto a train and riding it down into the Yukon, retracing the steps of the gold rush. One of the most famous gold rushes, immortalized by the likes of, ever heard of Jack London? Ever heard of Call of the Wild? Um, Robert Service wrote a bunch of poems about it. Very famous poems. He ended up there 10 years after the fact and very well respected. Highly awarded poet of the 19th, what is that, 20th century? He would have been in the 1900s. So the 20th century, early 20th century, turn of the century. Like, guys, it's a magical place. It's a mystical place. It is recorded in lore, fantasy, legend for all to dream about. Like, can you imagine? And with a little bit of cash, 
working a little bit of logistics, cruise your butt up there, ride a train into the valley, and then hike and fish and take pictures in the vast wilderness of Alaska, of Canada. Oh my God. I can dream a dream. Anyway, that, I believe, is going to wrap up tonight's episode about badass women of the Yukon Gold Rush. I know it's a departure in format, but it is not a departure of what we, um, what we strive to do around here, which is tell stories of adventure in the great outdoors. I don't think that we variated from that at all. So I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that it was entertaining, informational, and I hope that I'll see you back again next week. Let's go ahead and wrap it up here where I get to say things like, thank you for joining us once again. I hope you guys will submit to us your stories of adventure in the great outdoors. Anything you've ever gone and done, great things that you've checked out that you think the rest of us need to know about, that we want to hear about, shoot us an email to mywaywardstory at gmail.com. Other than that, please rate, review, and subscribe on your podcast player of choice to the best of my understanding. We are on every podcast player that is out there now, and the, the ratings, reviews, the subscriptions, that's what bumps us up, gets us visible, helps gets us into, get us into more people's ears. That is really important to us. Um, check out the website if you want to come and check out any of um, my social media, Instagram, our YouTube channel, all the links are over there if you want to support us because we are independent artists here. You can go over to patreon.com forward slash wayward stories. That's all actually can be accessed from the website. Got off track as I'm prone to do waywardstories.com. Find links to everything we do over there at the website. It's the easiest way to find us and get a hold of us. Um, that's going to do it for tonight. I'm glad you guys stuck around with it. I'm glad I got to have you back again for episode 12. And I can't wait to see you next week here again for episode 13. Until then, I hope you guys have a good rest of the week and weekend. Y'all be good to each other. Get out there and make a positive difference in the world. Let's make everything just a little bit better for everybody. We hit Studio 119, and I'd remind all of you out there listening, wherever you might be, that though the hill might be steep, and the trail be rocky, the mountaintop 